He had always such an energy. Even if he was old, he was in a way very healthy, very strong and powerful. And I remember my grandfather in that way, of someone who never quit, never had a desire to quit. And of course, uh, being very afraid of death. <laughs> Do you think he was afraid of death or just resentful of death? Maybe both. Maybe he was a Spaniard. And I see this uh, representation of, of death surrounding all his life. This handsome 17th century building on the Rue des Grands Augustins in Paris is where Picasso had had a studio since 1937. It was here that he had painted Guernica, it was here that he spent the war years, and it was here that he gave what help he could to his friends in the resistance. Where better than here to start our story about Picasso's battles with his arch enemy, death? The bars on this window in Picasso's Rue des Grands Augustins studio might as well have been the bars of a cell during the war. Picasso became more and more conscious of the German occupation, the claustrophobia, the curfew, above all the curfew, which meant that he had to get back by 10 o'clock at night, I think it was. And although he said later that he never actually painted the war, the war was in everything he painted. Les abords non voitus sont des choses légères et que l'on prend toujours beaucoup trop au sérieux. Lorsque tu m'as quitté, tu croyais bien mon cher me voir un jour très malheureux. In the first months of World War II, he did a series of paintings of sheep's heads, flailed, blood-drenched heads that he fed to his dogs. Grim, death-haunted images that would be his response to the horrors of Nazism. Isn't it surprising he stayed in Paris? He wasn't the kind of man to worry about saving his skin. He cared more about the survival of his art. His artworks were his children, and all the children he had brought into the world since his childhood were stored in his studio. We could have gone to Mexico, we could have gone to New York, but we didn't. We stayed. And as you see, we're still alive. I think we should believe him when he said that his staying in Paris during the occupation was not an act of courage, but rather uh, a matter of apathy. And his family life was quite complicated. He still uh, was in contact with Olga, who lived in France. He had a son with her, Paolo. He had a five-year-old daughter at the beginning of the war with Marie-Thérèse, called Maya and he saw them regularly, and he had his affair with Dora Maar. So to take all this world to America would have been difficult. But even if he had wanted to do that, I think one of the most important points is that he would not have wanted to leave his art behind. Les abords non voitures sont des choses légères et que l'on prend toujours beaucoup trop au sérieux. Most of his still lives are vanitases, allegorical references to death. Skulls on a bunch of leeks painted to look like crossbones. Another subject of the wartime pictures is the radiator. But the radiator was an allegory in reverse because instead of representing heat, it represented cold, the chill of wartime, lack of fuel, because there's no way the radiator worked. For me, this remains, even to this day, the most horrible time that one can live. I always felt that I would not be alive at the end of it. And also, I have many, many friends who died in, in the underground. People who went through all that don't like to talk about it. If we talk about it, it seems it's exaggerated what we say, you know, but it's, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't even say one-tenth of what it was like. 
most days during the war, Picasso would come and eat here at Le Catalan, a Catalan restaurant, a few doors away from his studio on the Rue des Grands Augustins. And it was fairly black market, and uh, Picasso ate reasonably well. But you can judge from the paintings he did of the place that food was very scarce. We really get what food was like during the war. A bit of camembert in its box, a round of miserable looking black sausage, an open drawer in which a lot of knives and forks are sort of falling out of it. And as Picasso said of it, they were souls in purgatory crying out for mercy. Although he usually came here with Dora Ma, who also lived round the corner, Rue de Savoie, the next street down, this is apparently where Picasso met Francois Gillot, who would take Dora's place. Francois Gillot was just 21, already a gifted and ambitious painter and a fan of Picasso's work. Francois was cool and self-assured, an ideal antidote to poor, tormented Dora Ma. I started to paint very young, and uh, I was 40 years younger than him, so I, I was at the beginning of my career. He was well established. Well, the, it would have been perhaps more difficult if we had been the same age. I thought my work was in front of me, and a number of his works were behind him, and uh, I did not compare myself to him. That would have been stupid. Uh, I have a certain amount of confidence in myself, and. Certainly, if I didn't have confidence in myself, I would certainly not have dared to be with him. And plus, Picasso was not a man who would play peacock, you know, he was very accessible and uh, he took his work very seriously, but he could also joke about it and uh, it was not formidable. So all difficulties were set aside. Picasso never told Dora, it's finished between us, because he didn't really want it to be finished. She knew that he was having a relationship with Francoise, but she couldn't believe that he would abandon her for a woman who was 40 years younger than he was. But that was a serious misjudgment on her part. Picasso's art always reflects the circumstances of his life, and we can watch the deterioration of his relationship with Dora in the exceedingly troubling portraits of her. In 1945, she had a serious nervous collapse and underwent psychiatric treatment, which cured her mania, but transformed this former atheist into a somewhat manic Catholic. This was taken on a wonderful day for the French, the day Paris was liberated. Everyone celebrated, even the dog. You see the French flag? I still have it. Father painted it, because the Germans had taken all the flags. So, he painted a red, white and blue flag. And we had a flag in our living room. We were classy people, you know. And when the first American soldiers arrived in Paris, they made a beeline for our house. When I came to Paris on my first furlough as a soldier, what I wanted to see more than anything else in the city, including the Eiffel Tower, was Pablo Picasso. And I was fortunate enough to find out where he lived, so I just went to his house and rang the bell. The studio was packed with paintings. I mean, there were hundreds, and drawings and things all, uh, you know. And He wasn't an orderly man, Picasso, at all. He had pictures thrown all over the floor, here and there. And then we find the tomato plant on the radiator at the end of the wall. The tomato plant has big red tomatoes on it. The sun is shining, the window opens, the Americans have arrived, the British have arrived, and the mood of the work has changed totally. He's got a new girlfriend, and peace, peace is at hand. 
Now that the darkness of war was well behind them, he and Françoise spent more and more time on the Côte d'Azur, where the town of Antibes had put the handsome, empty, but somewhat neglected Chateau Grimaldi at his disposal. He would fill it with art. For a few months, he came here every single day and he painted and painted. And in the end, he was so happy here, so happy with what he'd done, happy with the way he'd expressed his joy at being back into the Mediterranean, that he decided that he would give everything in the building to the city of Antibes, and that's how it became this wonderful museum. I think this painting, more than any other, sums up Picasso's feelings of rejuvenation, uh, his romance with Francoise, and his love affair with the Mediterranean. And you can feel that he feels relaxed, he feels happy, he's back in this classicistic world in which he grew up. I mean, here is Francoise dancing, uh, here could be a caricature of himself, the pipe player, the centaur, the boat maybe going from Catalonia to Greece, who knows. And it emanates this wonderful feeling of joy. Personally, when I see the Joie de Vivre, that's not at all my favorite painting of that period. I find it a little bit like a comic strip. God knows that a few years earlier he was not expressing the joie de vivre, he was expressing the drama of the Second World War. But then felt um, renewed by contact with nature, and what he loved most in nature was the sea itself, even though he, could, he swam very badly. <laughs> but, uh, but he loved to be near the sea. Virtually all the images, whether they're figures or whether they're still lives, concern the sea always one's conscious of the sea. Here, for instance, is a sailor in a striped vest, such as Picasso also liked to wear. Here you have a marvelous still life, which Francois Gillot believes was inspired by a Roman mosaic. You have the two octopuses, you have the conger eel, and then, of course, the sea urchin, which is a recurrent motif of nearly all these paintings. This painting over here, for instance, here is a woman holding these uh, sea urchins. But typically, Picasso has made a pictorial pun, of the sexual nature. The sea urchin is placed as if it's a kind of vagina dentata. And the same with the wonderful painting of the owl on the back of a chair, where the owl seems to be a self-portrait. It's an anthropomorphic painting. And once again, the two sea urchins are on the seat of the chair, and they make a kind of casual pun on genitalia. We had found a tiny owl who had a broken leg, and Picasso knew exactly how to repair the leg of that little animal. And since he didn't want to eat anything else, I had to go downstairs. There was a publisher, and they, they, there were a lot of uh, mice there. so. They would give me all the dead mice, you know, that had been caught during the day, and then I would feed the, the, the owl with that, and he was very pleased. He didn't say thank you, but he was very pleased. There was, at that time, no uh, canvases to be had in Antibes, so he had to paint on plywood boards. It was better to adopt a type of paint that could go on that type of support. On the way to the harbor, there was a shop where you could buy uh, the type of paint with, with which you paint boats. And he said that one has to be very sturdy because it serves in the sea, which is salty. That's what I must paint with. And he bought a certain number of boxes of that paint. And uh, there are some paintings which are really monumental, like the woman sitting where the, the legs. And then uh, also a very large nude which is painted on a, it's not wood, it's a, it's a cement board. Picasso's Mediterranean happiness was enhanced by the birth of a son, Claude, in 1947, and a daughter called Paloma in 1949. 
The proud father was 68 when Paloma was born. I think the fact that Picasso hadn't had a child in his life for 30 years mm -hmm. made a huge difference. And having these young children, being by the sea, this spirit is, is reflected in all the works of Francoise in that period. Very much so. I mean, of all my memories of my father, there's such playfulness. And the playfulness was sometimes serious. I mean, playing was important to him. Playing was a serious act. When Picasso's uh, mistress or wife changed, he had always to find a new image for her. Mm -hmm. And with Francoise, it was La Femme Fleur, wasn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, completely. Uh, and, and the colors change. I mean, you get into blues and greens, mm -hmm. uh, a combination that you don't see before in that way. And then her body, her body shapes also become yes. very important. Her yeah. little <laughs> bosom. <laughs> and, very, and she's also quite taller than the other uh, Yes, people. very you know, long neck. Yes. And I love all the drawings where you can see that the arches of her eyebrows and then the, the beauty mark that she has yes. is usually very prominent. But you see it more in the drawing than in the paintings. Uh, there are a few key things uh, that he was fascinated with. But it's more about a mood, I think. Well, it is me, but it doesn't necessarily look like me. When he did that, he, he wanted to find a kind of essence of, of what I am, but not the way I look. If I like it, I like it because it's a beautiful work of art, not because it's a portrait of me, that I don't care. If it's a portrait of somebody else, it would be just as beautiful or more, you know. I don't take it personally. In 1948, Picasso moved to a small house hidden away on the outskirts of Valoris, a town a few miles inland from Cannes. Valoris had been a pottery town since Roman times, over the years, it had become the save of Schlock. However, Picasso's ceramics would re-establish the place's prestige. Haven't been here for 50 years, but my God, it's changed a lot. This is the house, La Galoise, the Welsh house that Picasso bought because it was very, very difficult to find. It's in a tangle of little back streets. He also chose it because in this building here lived a mad lady called Madame Boissier, who was a kind of concierge, but told everybody that he didn't live here, Picasso is no good as a painter, go away. She was a teacher of dancing, of free dancing, and occasionally in the bushes here, you'd see middle-aged women dressed as nymphs cavorting around. And you then ran the gauntlet of all this, and there, over there, you would find the villa where he lived with Francoise. I think that after the horrors of Second World War, the desire to live as simply as possible was in many people's mind, and in mine as well as his. It, I don't think it had anything political about it. It was just like a reminder that nothing else was really necessary. Picasso decided to become a communist shortly after the end of the war in Europe. I later asked Jacqueline, his second wife, why. He was against war, against want, against fascism, she said. What was he for, I asked. She wasn't sure. However, he remained a not very ardent party member for the rest of his life. When Picasso paints, the art world sits up and begs so he can afford wild goose chases. What the communists needed from Picasso was his prestige, and one of their most important non-militaristic weapons in the Cold War was a peace movement. It had tremendous power and importance at the time, and Picasso was their main peace warrior. He was very, very important. Picasso traveled for the Communist Party for the different peace congresses quite a bit. He went to Poland, to Sheffield in England. Et c'est pour les congrès de la paix qui suis venu. J'espère que ça va être si. They wanted him to participate in organizations that were defending their cause, and they needed a poster. They found among a stack of lithographs the famous dove, which actually had been a lithograph of a pigeon and said, this is our peace dove. And this became, of course, Picasso's most famous contribution to the fight. 
And then wasn't there a question of his going to America? Yes, he had actually applied for a visa. He was supposed to go with a group, but the real problem for the Americans was Picasso's presence in the group. J. Edgar Hoover had started a file on Picasso for the FBI um, in uh, January 45 already. And he had started the My God. file. Yeah, look at this. And he had started the file actually with the idea that one day Picasso may ask for a visa mm -hmm. and that it should be refused. They would, for example, intercept telegrams. Here's an incoming telegram uh, from Moscow to Picasso. A big part of this document was sent to me blacked out by the FBI because they still consider part of this information to be secret and, and not available. This is the terrace of La Galoise. Simple terrace, simple house, and inside very simple rooms which were filled with odd bits of furniture Picasso and Francoise had bought. And they lived like good Communist Party members. Uh, there was a maid, but uh, there was absolutely no luxury or comfort or fancifulness at all. There were always toys all over the floor, evidence of the two children. Picasso didn't paint here. He worked at Le Fournas, which is a factory he'd bought, an old perfume distillery, which is in the main part of Valerie's. And when one arrived here, at least when I arrived here, he'd whisk you off as soon as possible down to Le Fournas. Polo, the sun, would drive the car, and there you'd see these amazing ceramics and new paintings and stuff that he was always delighted to show his friends. This was made in 1950, so you must have been one. Exactly, it so it was more a projection of me than a true portrait of me. But yet I always associated with it because everybody told me it was me, so. And it even looks a little bit like you, I think. Yes. Now, what are these various elements? So we, we have a basket here and then some pieces of, of flat wire that go around here and all around there. And um, then we've got some shoes. So apparently those shoes I think he found on walking yeah. down from the house to, to the Fournas, to the studio. And I think he'd always wanted to do a piece of sculpture which was off the ground. Right. Which seemed impossible. And this was the solution. It's really quite... It's amazing. ...miraculous how it stands. People always seem to to think that, that art should not be fun. I mean, this is completely ridiculous, of course. And my father thought that his art was quite serious, but some of the things that happened while he was doing it were fun for him because he discovered things that, you know, he, he did not even know were in him. So that's quite a giggle in a way. And it's not just for giggles, but to tickle the mind to make you see something that you would not see otherwise. This one does seem to have a kind of magical aspect to it. Now it's made up of, it's the big basket, isn't it? The, yes. The, um... Then those are the, the fawns from the palm trees, both here and in the face. That's natural shape. And then obviously some wood pieces. And then some pottery, the udder. Yeah, but you have to come around and see it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know you know, where they came from, uh, except that they were obviously from Valeris, but I don't know how those shapes came to be. Um, but it's actually also very realistic at the same time. <laughs> and then there are two other little bits there. Uh, the anus is a tube, which because at one moment was going to put a, a whistle like you get in toys and stick it in it, so like when you squeeze, they whistle. Right. <laughs> One of the reasons Picasso enjoyed being back in the south of France was the excellent bullfights to be seen at and Nîmes and nearby at Fréjus. He seldom missed a corrida or the dinners afterwards which we used to arrange for him and the bullfighters. Picasso's father, Don José, was a great aficionado a passion for bulls, and he took little Pablo to the bull ring from his earliest years. 
Pablo is a bullfighter at heart, Luis Miguel Dominguin, the great bullfighter, said. The bulls are in his soul. And another friend said, let's face it, the bull ring is Pablo's home. And I think this all explains his extraordinary identification with the bull, with the bullfighter, and also the identification of the women in his life with the poor old horses that the picadors have had a go at. The bullfight, of course, is a metaphor for a struggle and death. It's a beautiful way of dying. It's a beautiful way of killing. The bull is both a male opponent, because it's very masculine, and a woman that is penetrated at the end by the sword after this beautiful dance in which it's tormented and uh, uh, controlled and dominated by the bullfighter. So I think that these things clearly appealed to Picasso. Everyone thinks they know Picasso. Everyone knows a part, which is fine. And everyone has their favorite part, or section, or period, or this or that. So everyone feels comfortable with Picasso, and everyone owns Picasso. But in fact, he's always somewhere else, where you don't expect him. So there's always another you know, niche. This is why we put on this show, is that we showed something that everyone thought, oh, it's just a little ceramic and a thing, and blah, 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 just crafts, you know. But in fact, it's completely different. It's another world. It's a very, very complete, complex uh, body of his work, and it's a big surprise. This piece is very interesting because it's a, it's a piece that was um, designed by Madame Rami of the Madura factory, and it's, you see, it's just a tripod, sort of a you know, modern design. But my father got a hold of it, and he saw something completely different in it. He thought, well, what is this, you know, and, and he uh, had the idea to make it a portrait of my mother holding, holding her head like this on, on, in her hands. But it's, it's two ways. You have to go come see the other side. It has uh, the same thing, and you can also see her breast. And it's very interesting to find this solution. The ceramics are in many ways the Francoise period of Picasso's life, and because people haven't known them, they haven't seen um, his response to her in the way he did in this work. The work behind me is a piece of kiln furniture, uh, which is a typical thing of Picasso to select. That is, it's an ordinary piece of ceramic that had been used to support other ceramics in the kiln. It had undergone many firings, and he turned it into not only a portrait of her, a recognizable portrait of her, but something that has an echo of a kind of ancient funerary monument. So he mixes her presence with an ancient tradition. The Mediterranean was the center of culture in antiquity and his background as everyone's background in Europe in our culture is really based on Greco-Roman antiquity and it's interesting for him to see and compare himself to the great masters or even the unknown masters of of history and he was very amused that maybe one day those shards, those bits and pieces of, of pots, broken pots that he had decorated, would be found, you know, again in, in some sort of archaeological situation. And people would, would have to figure out which one of the old uh, Greek painters had painted these things. Picasso was amazingly generous to the city of Valeris. He gave this wonderful sculpture, The Man with the Sheep, which he regarded as perhaps his masterpiece. He liked the idea of having it as a public monument, which people could relate to in very different ways. Or he said it's not Christian, but people do relate to it as a Christian symbol. Some people relate to it as a classical image of today. 
Other people think of it as a symbol of a working man's life. In 1950, Picasso was made an honorary citizen of Valeries, and in response to this, he agreed to decorate a Romanesque chapel which had been part of the chateau. And he finished in 1951 these two great panels of war and peace. The panel on the left here is peace. And it's far and away the more successful of the two. And here I think we should remember that Picasso had always been a pacifist. And so one feels that his heart is very much in this panel. We have people dancing, the sea in the background. We have this beautiful image in the center of Claude, his son, plowing the sea with Pegasus. Francois suckling the newborn Paloma. And it is a beautiful ensemble. Here on the right is war. And there are some marvelous bits in it. But Picasso, who's usually so good at depicting violence, we only have to think of Guernica, I think hasn't really brought it off. There's something very corny about these black, gigantic figures stabbing each other. This symbolism doesn't work for me, and I don't think that it's anything like as great as the peace panel. At the end is this later panel, which I think is one of the worst paintings he ever did. It's about all the races of the world paying tribute to the dove of peace, but it seems to me very banal indeed. At the time he was painting the central panel, he was at work on the massacre in Korea, which is an overt piece of agitprop. It shows a group of women and children being massacred by a lot of evil people with machine guns, and it just doesn't work at all. And I think after that, Picasso realized that although he would remain a member of the Communist Party, indeed was a very good and obedient member of the Communist Party, he would give up painting on the Communist line. By 1953, Picasso's relationship with Francois Gillot had begun to unravel. He looked around for a new companion. There were many eager candidates. He saw us sitting, smoking and having a coffee. <laughs> and uh, he, he came over the wall and as he was very small, we couldn't see him. We only saw that picture, this one, um, come over the wall. And we knew it was an invitation to his studio. And we knew it was me because nobody else had a ponytail like this. So we rushed in and uh, he started talking to us and asking me if I would sit for him. Then another day he would make me visit his studio. Uh, we went upstairs where the, he had a little room with a bed and a chair. And then he would jump on the bed and I stayed at the door thinking, Wow, am I meant to jump on the bed too? <laughs> but Andy, I was terrified that it, you know, I think he was trying to find out what I would do. He was 73 and I was uh, 19. So now I'm getting nearer to his age. I keep thinking, uh, what was he looking for in me? I was a relief for him, perhaps. And I was there like a new life, you know, a new story. When it was over, it was over. You know, a relationship has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I still like him as an artist, but as a person, it was over. It had run its course. Once I turned my head in a different direction, it is, that's it. Francois Gillot finally walked out on Picasso in the summer of 1953. He was desperately lonely. Sylvia David was just a model. She wasn't a mistress. He had two, if not three, other girlfriends. But he couldn't make up his mind. One of the women was Jacqueline Rock, the wife of a colonial official who'd got bored to death living in Africa 
and had come to work in Valoris. I think it was the year Françoise left. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline Hutin came to the shop, perhaps to buy something, and we got on well together. I was expecting my second baby. I was no longer working in the factory. I was in the shop. One day she asked me, when you have the baby, who will replace you? I spoke to my parents-in-law, and when I had to stop working, Jacqueline replaced me. Jacqueline was a charming girl, very intelligent, nice, very much a woman. Très agréable, très très femme. Très femme, en effet, oui. After the birth of my baby, I came back to the pottery, and Jacqueline stopped working there. After that, I don't know. As I said before, we weren't in on the secret of their relationship. I came into Picasso's life around this time, and I saw a great deal of Jacqueline. She was extremely pretty. She was the same height as Picasso. That was always rather important. He was so short. And indeed, she could have been his daughter. She had great big eyes like him. And as always, when Picasso had a new mistress, he developed a new image for her. Picasso had always loved the paintings of Delacroix, particularly his famous painting, The Women of Algiers. And it transpired that Jacqueline was the double of one of the women in this famous painting in the Louvre. And the early images of her are of this rather exotic, slightly orientalist figure. And Jacqueline, who didn't have a particularly long neck, she had a rather short neck, ends up with a long neck and with a totally different allure which she gradually came to adopt in herself. Jacqueline's slightly orientalist image was very appropriate to the new house Picasso had just bought. The Villa La Californie was a great big turn-of-the-century villa in execrable taste, but rather glamorous and exotic. I became a regular visitor. Picasso turned out to be tremendously house-proud. He loved having people to see his grand new residence. All his old friends, they would all come and see him. He would clown a bit. There would be Indian feathered headdresses. There would be bowler hats. And Picasso loved all this. Because what people don't realize about Picasso was his enormous charm, his geniality, and his generosity. Towards the end of his life, Picasso tried to cannibalize the art of the past. He took one great artist after another, and he took their art and Picassified it. There's no other way to describe it. And he was quite systematic in these cannibalistic feasts. In the summer of 1957, I went to see Picasso. And uh, Jacqueline told me that he was upstairs. He was in a very, very bad mood because he'd taken on Velazquez. Like Jacob Wrestling of the Angel, he decided to take on the greatest Spanish master of all. We could hear him thundering around upstairs. He'd set aside a special room for this next door to where he kept his pigeons. And you could hear him stamping around. You could hear things falling over. And Jacqueline said, l'abominable homme des neiges, the abominable snowman is at it again. And occasionally he'd come down in a vile temper. And this went on for months. When Picasso first saw this great painting, it was shortly after the death of his sister Conchita. He was 14 years old. And his father had brought him to the Prado to see these masterpieces for the first time. He was fascinated by the figure of the little princess, the little infanta, in the center, who is the same age, roughly, as Conchita. And he's concentrated a great many of the studies on her. Among his variations, 
40 variations of the subject. Uh, there is one of a little boy playing a piano. And I said, what relevance does this have to the Velasquez? And he said, you don't get it? He said, and of course, this is the gesture that the uh, lady in waiting is making to the infant. In fact, she's offering her some water. But it looks exactly like someone playing the piano. With high-rise buildings going up all over Cannes, Picasso began to feel that his villa, the California, was being overlooked. He needed privacy. He always wanted privacy. And so he looked around for an alternative, and he found this great chateau here, the Chateau de Vauvenargues. Douglas Cooper and I were the first guests, and Jacqueline photographed us on the steps of the chateau. And then he took us around and showed us everything, including a great big gun he'd bought, because the chateau included a great slab of the Montan Sainte Victoire, and it had a lot of game. And he proposed to do some shooting. Of course, he never did. He used to boast that he was a very good shot and used to go to fairgrounds and win prizes, but Jacqueline discouraged him from taking the gun out. Of course, the first question we asked Picasso was, what was he going to do about the Mont Sainte Victoire, which had been Cezanne's favorite motif? And he shrugged his shoulders and said, just wait and see. And we waited and waited, and finally he found a solution. He saw the Mont Sainte Victoire in the terms of Jacqueline. It's like a great recumbent figure with a pine tree on one side, now in the Art Institute Chicago. And that was his Montagne Sainte Victoire. Francois Gillot used to say, used to complain, that Picasso had a way of setting his women up on a plinth and finding a wonderful image for them and then shoving them off onto the floor and using them like a doormat. Here we have a perfect example of this. Here is Jacqueline pissing on the beach. What could be a more degrading image than that? And yet it's painted in such a lively way and the image is so gay and full of light and fun that somehow it's not vulgar, it's not, uh, it doesn't make us feel uncomfortable. And I think he borrowed this image from Rembrandt the Rembrandt in the National Gallery in London, where the woman is holding up her shift and evidently was at one moment pissing into the stream. And I know it was a painting by Rembrandt that Picasso particularly liked. In 1961, Picasso finally married Jacqueline, with whom he'd been living since 1954. And they looked for the most secluded property they could find and they moved to this beautiful Notre-Dame-de-Vie, named after this pilgrimage church. The gates to Notre-Dame-de-Vie were usually barred to everybody because they wanted to work. He wanted to spend his last years in isolation, working, working, working. Jacqueline was told to keep people out, even members of the family. This extraordinary property could be easily fortified against the world. It had ramparts, it had a canal. And I think there was another aspect to the property that appealed to Jacqueline. The name of this church, Notre Dame de Vie. She saw herself as Notre Dame de Vie, Our Lady of Life. She saw herself as Picasso's savior at the end of his life. She identified with the church and with the property. And after his death, she stayed on here until she ultimately killed herself. Before he died, Picasso endeavored to cannibalize as much as he could of European art. He sent for slides of old and not so old masters and had Jacqueline project them on one of the studio walls. And they would all spend evenings dissecting Rembrandt's Night Watch or Van Gogh's self-portrait in a straw hat. Rembrandt inspired a whole new cast of characters, cavaliers and musketeers. And the Van Gogh self-portrait 
inspired some of Picasso's self-portraits. I remember well my father and I going almost every month to Notre Dame de Vie to visit him until very close before he died. It was quite usual to go to, to southern France from Paris driving with, with, uh, with my father to, to, to see my grandfather. And I just uh, remember a, f a serious matter always. The only weapon he got was his heart and he went very, very strongly until the last day of his life. And one feels sometimes those last works are a kind of race against death. I mean, he's pitting himself against death. Mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, but maybe at that time he had not any more sexual activity, so that was, uh, that was already death, you know? Sometime in his 80s, Picasso discovered to his horror that he was impotent. But typically, he put his impotence to good use. This desperate, desolate image of a kiss was painted when Picasso was nudging 90. It's a dead kiss. There's no joy in it. The painting is obviously self-referential. I mean, it's a Picasso with his enormous eyes looking absolutely miserable. And there's no joy in the younger woman, who is evidently Jacqueline. And I find it one of the most moving of the late images because it sums up the feelings of a very old man who is impotent who loves his wife, but is incapable, really, of doing very much about it. I think it's one of his saddest pictures. Eros and Thanatos, love and death, had always been intertwined in Picasso's work, and never more than at the end of his life, when death cast its shadow over everything he did. When he was well into his 80s, he devoted a wonderful series of engravings to the subject of La Celestina, the famous procuress of Spanish fiction. Celestina was a spreader of syphilis. Picasso also told me, when he was young, the town crier who went around announcing people's deaths was always an old woman, like the Celestina. Picasso continued to work right up to the end. He died aged 91 on April the 8th, 1973. In the last few years of his life, Picasso didn't come here all that much, but he loved the place, and this is where he's buried. And he chose to be buried underneath one of his most beautiful sculptures, the woman holding a vase. The funeral was a very unfortunate and unhappy event. Uh, Jacqueline wouldn't allow his children and some of his grandchildren to come, and so they gathered here, and they had to watch the funeral from afar. And then, in 1986, it was Jacqueline's turn to die. And I came to the funeral. It was the last time I was here and it was an unbelievably moving occasion. We watched the woman with the vase, this great big sculpture, being pushed back over the grave. And as I looked back, I thought that the woman with the vase had somehow turned into the woman with the lamp. And the woman with the lamp was Jacqueline, for Picasso, his Notre Dame de Vie. I have to have a palette and a little painting and just going around there making nice little paintings. He was, you know, doing something else. He was, you know, wrecking a havoc. And then suddenly you discover, after all, you thought it might become a woman, but actually it's a, it's a goat. But then his pen goes on and transforms it into a fish. It's a never-ending process. And that was what was interesting to him, to see where his mind would take him. You, uh, you know what it is? Voodoo. Do you understand voodoo? My story about Picasso might as well start here as anywhere else. This is the Chateau de Castille. Douglas Cooper, the British art collector, and I 
lived here for 12 years. We moved in Douglas's great collection of pictures, and basically it became a private museum of Cubist art. Picasso, Braque, Leger, Juan Gris, from 1907 to 1914, and people started pouring in. After we bought this house in 1951-52, Picasso was one of our first visitors. Came and had dinner in this room, as he frequently would, again and again after the bullfights. Picasso would come with his entourage, he'd come with his new mistress, Jacqueline, he would become with Cocteau, members of his family, with uh, Dominguin, the bullfighter. And if the dinners got too big, because this room held about ten people, we would go and have great big dinners out there in the old silkworm building, where they used to keep silkworms, where the Picasso murals are. And we had many, many memorable dinners in this place. Picasso was born in Malaga, in the south of Spain, in 1881. At first, the midwife thought he'd been stillborn. In desperation, the doctor, who is his uncle, puffed cigar smoke into his face, whereupon little Pablo came to life with a great roar. At the end of his life, 90 years later, Picasso replayed the scene of his birth in this gory drawing. Picasso was named Pablo after his famously pious uncle, who was a canon of this great cathedral, this amazing Baroque building. And as a result, the church, Catholicism, the rituals of the cathedral were very much part of his life, his family's life. He came of an illustrious line of knights and clerics. There was great uncle Pedro, who had lived as a hermit in the hills above Cordoba, and a famous forebear who had been Archbishop of Lima and Captain General of Peru. Later in life, Picasso always claimed to be an atheist, but as his widow Jacqueline told me, he was nothing of the sort, he was more Catholic than the Pope. I am God, Picasso was once overheard to say. I think we should remember that always at the root of Picasso's greatest work is this search for the sacred fire. Remember, Andalusia, this, the southern extreme of the peninsula, is the most backward part of Spain. It's, it lags behind. It's a very rural, very agrarian society. Even the cities have very little industry. Educationally, it lags behind, always has. So um, the superstitions are strong in Andalusia. Preoccupation with death is strong in Andalusia. Certain morbidity is strong. This is the Plaza de la Merced, where Picasso was brought up by a rather possessive and bossy mother. He had two old aunts who stayed at home, worked at home. There was a fiercely mustachioed old maid, and then, of course, there were his two sisters. His father, like most Andalusian fathers, was almost never at home. He was off uh, running the art school, running the museum. He went to bullfights, and he was famous for being a wit in the local cafe, and also for going to whorehouses. But as Picasso grew up, he would see more of his father because it was his father who taught him how to draw. Picasso's father was a painter and usually thought of as a very bad painter. A painter above all of pigeons. The town hall of Malaga bought this painting of pigeons in 1878, three years before Picasso was born. And is it really such a bad painting? Isn't it rather strong? Isn't it defiantly ugly? 
it seems to me that what the father has done is to capture the kind of pigeonness of pigeons. One of the most famous stories about Picasso's youth concerns an incident that took place when Picasso was 13 or 14, and his father, who had been training him as a painter, left him to paint the legs of a pigeon in one of his pigeon paintings. He'd actually cut the legs off the pigeon, nailed them to a board, left Picasso to copy this, and went for a walk. And when he came back an hour or two later, Picasso had painted the legs of the pigeon so beautifully that the father, Don Jose, said, my God, you're a greater painter than I am. Here are my brushes, here are my paints, here is my palette. I'm not gonna paint anymore. But I don't think this story is true. I think it was one of the legends that he came to believe about himself. But it's enormously interesting because Picasso went on to become one of the great pigeon painters of all time. I mean, we only have to think of the Dove of Peace, which is in fact a pigeon. As he told me once, he said, given the enormous amount of pigeons my father painted, I've gone into pigeon painting too. I'm repaying him in my pigeons. Behind me are the ruins of the famous Moorish castle, which dominates Malaga, with its crumbling hanging gardens and its dungeons and its battlements. And this used to be Picasso's favorite playground. He lived just over there around the corner. And he used to come here because this is where the gypsies hung out. And he loved spending mornings with the gypsies because they used to teach him tricks. They taught him Cante Hondo, they taught him flamenco, and they even taught him how to smoke a cigarette up one nostril. And this kinship with the gypsies stayed with him for the rest of his life. When Picasso was 10, his father lost his job at the local museum and the family left sunny Mediterranean Malaga for cold, wet, blustery La Coruña, the northwesternmost point of Spain. How they all hated it. His father, Don Jose, had a good job teaching in the local art school, and they had a decent enough apartment. The art school where Don Jose taught and Picasso studied could be glimpsed from the balcony. Picasso always maintained that he never drew like a child. But we can't necessarily believe him because there aren't any of his childhood drawings left. Somebody must have destroyed them and I suspect it was him. Uh, the first drawing we know is done at the age of 10, and it's not a particularly brilliant drawing. He said he drew, drew like Raphael. It's nothing like Raphael. It's rather inept. And we see him becoming a great draftsman when he's here at this art school. Most students' drawings are as dead as the plaster cast they're drawing, but somehow Picasso's drawing is so sensuous and so alive and so sexy that you realized from it that he had to be on the way to becoming a great master. One other point I think is interesting, that he always loved plaster as a medium. He liked to work in plaster, and he much preferred the plaster, the whiteness of the plaster, the dirtiness of the plaster, the mess of the plaster, uh, to bronze, which he always felt was museum-y and expensive and grand and um, too luxurious. I think Picasso always felt that his sculptures were magical in some respect, that they, they were like a witch doctor's fetishes, they were, they were a shaman's creations. Do you agree with that? I think they were very dear to him. I mean, actually, he never parted from his sculptures. No. Uh, and actually, and, well, actually, never parted from the originals. Mm -hmm. And usually, there were, you know, two of each made, and one he kept, and one was for sale. So, 
that he could always hang on to them, yes. and they were very much, you know, part of the mobilier of the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember we used to sit on the couch exactly. of the California. One of the fascinating things in your mother's book are the stories of Picasso's superstitions yes. and the intensity of them. Absolutely. Actually, we never went out of the house without sitting on the steps uh, and waiting for a minute so that we would know to be sure to, that we would come back to the house. And through his life, he kept adding on new things. You know, he had a lot of, of Russian manias that he'd gotten from Olga and then, you know, added on... Invented ones. They were his own superstitions. They weren't necessarily... Some, yes, they were, you know, a bit of both. Some were from one partner or another and mm. some were invented. Uh, but he was very ritualistic, you could say. Yes. The streets of La Coruña were famous for their glassed-in balconies. Picasso enjoyed exploring the place. He was only 13, but his father kept him working away at models like this bearded tramp and the melancholy beggar girl who inspired what he called his first real paintings. Paintings he would keep until his dying day. Despite all this precocious mastery, Picasso very nearly gave up painting while he was at La Coruña. Picasso's last wife, Jacqueline, told me a story which Picasso told only to the women in his life. And it involves the death of Picasso's youngest sister, Conchita, in 1895, who is buried here. Her family were too poor to provide a gravestone for her, so we don't know exactly which one it is, but there are these little numbered crosses, and maybe one of those refers to her. Now, Conchita developed diphtheria. There was an outbreak of diphtheria in La Coruña, and in those days, it was a very fatal disease. There was a serum which was available in Paris, newly developed, newly invented serum, and while they were waiting for the serum to arrive, Picasso, age 13, made a vow to God that if his sister, whom he particularly loved, Conchita, lived, he would never paint again. Uh, the trouble was that he did paint again, and Conchita died. The result was that for the rest of his life, young women, young girls, in a way had to be sacrificed on the altar of Picasso's art. And it explains his relationships with so many women, it explains his identification with the Minotaur, the figure to whom girls, virgins, maidens had to be sacrificed. It explains his tenderness, his compassion, the extraordinary sweetness of many of his images of young women. And it also explains the darker side, the hint of menace that is always there. And this is so typical of Picasso's life, this paradox, this ambivalence towards everything he loved. Poor Don Jose had hated La Coruña, hated the weather, hated his colleagues, and then on top of everything else, his beloved daughter had died. It's a great relief in the spring of 1895 to move to Barcelona and teach in the city's great art school. Although Picasso had been enrolled at the local art school, he was also apprenticed to a religious painter because his father thought that there was a lot of money to be made in religious painting and also there was a lot of fame to be made and as the family had these religious antecedents this seemed like a good idea and so his first religious painting was this one uh, the first communion of his sister Lola and instead of a priest and Picasso was proud of this detail instead of having a priest in the conventional way there's a clumsy altar boy who's fiddling with the vase of flowers uh, there's also this curious uh, detail here only two of the candles are lit. Now, I think this is a deliberate piece of allegory because in the census, 
taken a few years before, there is another member of the Picasso family noted, a boy child, and presumably there was a son who died. And this is a reference to the two living children, Lola and Pablo, and the two dead children, the dead baby and Conchita. This great big allegory, Science and Charity, was painted by Picasso when he was 15. It was a major bid for national celebrity. The painting was also intended as a tribute to Picasso's uncle, Salvador, who was a very well-known doctor in Malaga and who the family depended on for some of their finances. Picasso couldn't stand his uncle, but all the same, the doctor represents Uncle Salvador, but the role is played by his father, Don Jose. The girl in bed is in fact a beggar girl, a gypsy girl they found in the street, and after she was through posing, she pinched the blanket. The nun is not a nun. The nun is a boy dressed up as a nun in some borrowed uh, habit. Mawkish subjects like this were very much in fashion. In this case, the allegory, supposedly a rather upbeat one of how great charity and science were together, science represented by the doctor, charity by the nun, isn't really working, as was the case with Conchita a year or so earlier. And there is this rather desolate feeling about the painting that all is not well, that the girl is going to die. And I think that is uh, because it's done in memory of Conchita, and that is what comes through this painting. Well, Picasso wrote Spanish badly also. Did he? <laughs> yes. He write the Spanish uh, full of mistakes. Yes. Well, Franco did the same. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very good customer. I'm so glad you said that. I was on. That is so clear. And so important. And after church, there were a lot of whorehouses near the churches, weren't there? Here I am in the celebrated tavern El Catragats, four cats in Catalan, which was the focal point of Picasso's Barcelona life. With me are the descendants of two of Picasso's closest El Catragat's friends. I mean, his father, Don Jose, was famous for going to whorehouses. That's more Spanish. He mm. was more Spanish-minded, you mm. know? Yes. And he, here, his father didn't enter. Mm. His yeah. father never came here? No. Well, uh, Catragat was uh, the place in which the younger uh, artists of... It was here at El Catragat's that Picasso made his mark as a brilliant draftsman in a show of drawings of his fellow painters, writers and students. No girls, it wouldn't have been respectable. Everything pointed to Paris. Paris was the mecca of the art world, so anybody born outside French borders would inevitably dream of coming to the capital and seeing where the action was. Picasso had Spanish friends there, uh, friends from Barcelona. I mean, you know, it's the usual mythology of uh, La Boheme, uh, you know, addicts, uh, no heat in the winter, unbearable heat in the summer, uh, communal sleeping, sharing beds, eight-hour shifts, etc., etc. And a lot of this sounds like the stuff of Puccini opera, but in fact, uh, in Picasso's case, it was truth. On his first trip to Paris, Picasso was accompanied by his best friend, Carles Casagemas, only a year older than himself, 
but already an anarchista and a decadente. He was also a gifted poet and painter, but already addicted to drink and drugs and probably a manic depressive, and he was totally dependent on Picasso. These letters are half from Casagemas and half from Picasso, and they were sent to my father and my uncle. Well, they speak about the things they do in Paris, how they have to gain their life, to, to eat and to pay the apartment, and, and the friends they, they met in Paris. Uh, well, the girls she didn't know in, in Montmartre, a little bit of everything. And these are all letters which are enormously important. They tell us a great deal about these early trips to Paris and what they got up to, and they're quite amusing. I mean, a lot of funny details about the theatre they went to, the Grand Guignol, and, and all kinds yeah. of things. They were very young people, without much money, in that they tried to amuse themselves. Mm -hmm. I liked you. This is where Casagemas ended his life, in February 1901. Picasso had fixed him up with a girl called Germaine, but Casagemas was impotent or sexually dysfunctional, so Germain told him the relationship was over. At a farewell dinner in this Montmartre cafe, Casagemas tried and failed to shoot Germain and then shot himself. Picasso was away in Madrid at the time, but back in Paris he would commemorate his friend's death with this and two other agonized portraits complete with bullet holes. Three years after Casagemas blew his brains out, Picasso set to work on a puzzling allegory to be called La Vie. Until recently, it had been something of a mystery. Why was Casagemas holding his hand out like that? Why was Germain clinging to him? What was all this about? I think I've solved the problem. The answer has to do with Picasso's recent experience and discovery of tarot cards. Anyone familiar with occult iconography will recognize the upward and downward gesture. It symbolizes the most famous of all mystical axioms. Whatever is below is like that which is above, as all things are made from one. X-rays reveal that underneath the figure of Casagemas is a self-portrait. It was originally to be about himself. He chose the name La Vie and characteristically turns La Vie upside down. What this painting is all about is death. Later, Picasso said that the blue period had been inspired by Casagemas' suicide. One thing that I always feel has to be stressed about Picasso's blue period is that it is not unique. People have always talked about it as if it were some sort of special invention of the young Picasso, and there are all sorts of myths that have to do with the fact that blue pigment might have been cheaper. Nothing of the sort. Blue was really the color of the moment, and it uh, was synonymous with the sense of the spiritual, of the ethereal. It was a world that had to do with the airborne, with feelings, uh, with a uh, floating experience, anything that said goodbye to hard material facts of the 19th century. And uh, there are artists galore who work in a similar tone. So that Picasso's blueness is just part of a general mood, an effort to join what is spiritual, saintly, melancholic. This quaint little building, La, La Pangile, hasn't changed since the beginning of the century. It was the headquarters of the Bon de Picasso, Picasso's gang. The gang consisting of writers, Apollinaire, Marc Jacob, 
and above all his girlfriends. And they used to come here night after night after night, and Freddie, the proprietor, used to play away at his guitar. Freddie had two sons, both of them bad hats. One of them, I think, got murdered here, if I remember rightly. And there used to be these fights between the artists and the Apache, the local gangsters, because the Apache used to come to get their girls back from the painters who had made off with them, and there they were at the Lapin Gilles. And one of the most famous paintings associated with this place, it's called Au Lapin Gilles, is a painting of Picasso in Harlequin costume with Germain, with whom he was now having an affair, but who had been the cause of Casa James's suicide. The disguise that he favoured most, I suppose, was the Harlequin disguise. But it's not jolly Commedia dell'arte Harlequin. I mean, it was a rather satanic figure, or at least a very ambivalent figure. Andalusians celebrate Carnival. Carnival is all about masking. And I'm sure that Picasso must have observed Carnival. You just see it in his paintings. The Harlequin, of course, is a figure there. And again, in, in, in Carnival, uh, that figure can be a figure of fun, as you say, but also can shade off into a sinner, sinister, dangerous, threatening, menacing figure as well. If you have a mask on your face, if you're not seen, you can't be identified. This frees you. It frees you to do whatever you want. You're free to engage in whatever misbehavior you want, sexual or political or otherwise. And of course, masking lets you experiment with different identities. You can literally change yourself into something else. It's unusual in its size, of course. Picasso painted very few large-scale pictures, and when he did, they are always major statements. And the, the Salter Bank certainly represents that kind of summing up. The realm that the Salter Banks occupy in that picture uh, was actually observed by Picasso on the outskirts of Paris. Um, it's the the fairgrounds uh, where itinerant performers uh, played, and this is where Picasso was able to watch acrobats in performance, but it was also a place where he could observe them living their marginal life. The, um, the fairgrounds themselves were um, uh, literally separated geographically and socially from the center of the city, uh, and the realm is sometimes referred to as the terrain vague, or vague realm, vague terrain, literally the outskirts or margins of society, uh, but almost as if it's a, uh, a landscape that uh, represents not just another place, but another time. When he finally settled in Paris in 1904, Picasso moved into a squalid warren of studios called the Bateau Lavoir known to poets as the Acropolis of Cubism. This ramshackle wooden hovel subsequently burned down. Outside was a little square with a fountain, which is where a few months later he would meet the woman who would become his first great love. Elle vivait depuis 1901. She'd been living since 1901 at the Bateau Lavoir. Picasso met her in 1904. She'd been a professional model since 1901. She'd posed for the greatest painters of the time. When Picasso arrived, he saw her. She was a truly beautiful woman. She had almost oriental, almond-shaped eyes, and she was shapely and luscious. She was a fine model and a very, very beautiful woman, which was why she was called La Belle Fernande. Picasso passed by this beautiful woman every day, but he never dared speak to her because he was so shy. When Fernand began living with him, Picasso said to her one day, I want to show you something new. What he showed her was opium, and they began smoking opium in 1905. Et à partir de ce, de ce moment-là, c'était deux, deux, trois fois par semaine. Chez les From then onwards, they used to meet up with friends two or three times a week, either at somebody's house or in his studio. 
They brought a straw mat from the studio and they all smoked opium, either in the studio or at the homes of friends. It was opium that made Fernand feel her love for Picasso. It was under the effects of opium that she became aware of her love for Picasso. By the spring of 1906, Picasso had been away from Spain for two years. He was desperate to get back. He wanted to go away for the summer somewhere quiet, somewhere healthy, somewhere serene. And Casanovas, his great friend, the sculptor, had told him about Gozol. A great deal of the journey had to be done on muleback, and it was quite perilous. Part of it involved going up the side of a precipice with a huge drop on one side, rocks on the other. They were on muleback. Fernand's girths came loose. She started to topple off into the abyss, saved. On they went. Finally, after hours and hours and hours on mules, they got to Gozol, and it was paradise. It was everything they wanted it to be. And uh, they settled in for the summer, and Picasso began to work and work and work. When Picasso moved to a new locality, the new locality nearly always is reflected in some way in his work. At Gozol, this was not the case. The subject matter is mostly nude boys, nude Fernandes. It's nothing much to do with the actual place, except in one respect, the color, the color of the earth. The colors of Fernand in these beautiful paintings he did of her, particularly the big tall nude, are the colors of this earth, of this red limestone which you see all around you, this place which is called Las Rojas, and that permeates all the works that he did at Gozol. He embarked on a completely new style. It was freer, it was more idyllic. Fernand was his muse, his model. He was greatly inspired by her, and there was a feeling of kind of elation and joy in the work. <laughs> This is where Picasso and Fernand spent 10 weeks in the summer of 1906. These little tiny rooms. How he managed to paint, I can't imagine. One of the paintings was virtually seven foot tall, and there were six more big paintings, massive drawings, sketchbook. He brought back bits of wood and carved them. Somehow he managed all this. Okay, there's not much furniture. This is probably the original pieces of furniture. But they were sublimely happy here, and uh, Fernand wrote letters saying that they were having a kind of honeymoon and uh, they were blissfully happy. And once they got back to Paris, they were never really happy again. Paris was boiling hot. The studio was stifling. Bed bugs had infested everything and mice had got into the place. And to Fernand's horror, her banana-colored parasol her most treasured possession had been devoured by mice. Over the next few months, Fernand's image would totally change. From being a sensuous, classicistic goddess, Fernand would be metamorphosed into a primitive earth mother, sturdy as a turnip, to quote an apt description of Picasso's recent model, Gertrude Stein. In the course of the summer, he had discovered a Madonna and child in the church at Gozol, and this had had quite an impact on him. However, Picasso would always insist that the principal influence on his work of this period was an even earlier manifestation of Spanish art. When these primitive Iberian figures, 4th to 3rd century BC, were first put on view at the Louvre in 1906, Picasso was fascinated by them. 
this was something that he could use. Uh, they came from the part of the world that he came from, and he said to Apollinaire, the poet, his great friend, one day, I'd love to have those. Unfortunately, Apollinaire's secretary, who was a kind of gay, criminal, gigolo, overheard all this, and he decided to go off and steal a couple of them so that Picasso could have his wish. He went off to the Louvre where they were shown. He saw that the guard was asleep. He took one out of the case, stuck it in his trousers, and walked out with it. So successful was it that he went back the following day and stole another one. And Picasso paid 20 francs or 30 francs for them. And they were very useful to him because they were imbued with the sacred fire that he was always after. This was the sacred fire of prehistoric Spain. And as usual, he did what he could with it until yet another Spanish source took its place. Picasso was one of the earlier admirers of El Greco, who around the turn of the century was a virtually unknown painter. When he was a student, he'd copied El Greco and horrified his father that his son should paint something so outrageous and mannered and absurd as an El Greco. And then a kind of acquaintance of his a much better known Spanish painter, Zuluaga, flashy, flamboyant painter of portraits and genre scenes who would become Franco's favorite painter. Zuluaga, who had a house in Montmartre, had recently bought this great painting by El Greco, one of his masterpieces. And so he had the great good fortune to have a major old master round the corner, and inevitably the experience is reflected in his work. Not immediately. It wasn't until he started work on the Demoiselle d'Avignon that he bethought himself of this painting. And it is no coincidence that the canvas he ordered for the Demoiselle is virtually the same size as this painting. But that is not all. The extraordinary darkness of the Demoiselle, the malevolent feeling that one gets, the sense of evil, the sense of heaven and hell, all these things that Picasso was out in his search for magic to put into his imagery. I think all of this comes in a way from this great painting. Picasso had taken a cellar in the Bateau Lavoir, a dark cellar. It was very, very hot. He stripped naked in order to paint it. He was five foot three, the women about eight foot tall, and night after night he would work away at this painting. His mistress, Fernand, locked away upstairs, as she said, waiting, waiting, waiting for Picasso, who would be in an ever worse temper. And then, while he was battling away with the demoiselle, Picasso found a solution. He paid a visit to the Ethnographical Museum at the Trocadero, by accident, he always said. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Tribal art was to have an enormous impact, not only on the Demoiselle, but on Picasso's view of art as having a magic function. All alone in that ill-lit, filthy, smelly, cluttered museum, he later said, I understood that the Negroes used their sculpture as weapons. Art could kill, it could exorcise. Tribal art made Picasso understand why he was a painter. What struck me in the Demoiselle was that the two evil Demoiselles, the African ones, those that he uh, said were inspired by African masks and figures in the Trocadero and which were evil spirits, he didn't know what he was. Only those two on the right, when we look mm -hmm. at it, only those were mutilated and incomplete. He punished them magically on the canvas. Mm -hmm. One is blinded, isn't she? One is blinded. In other words, Picasso saw himself as a shaman. He saw himself because as a shaman. Because this is a shaman's view. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely.
this nudes in the forest of 1907 was probably the most important painting at the Chateau de Castille. And I remember Douglas bought it for the equivalent of $10,000 in the pawn shop at Geneva. Picasso used to come quite often and he admired this painting, particularly because he said it was all done in one go. It was done like a Van Gogh with this tremendous energy. And uh, we asked him about the references to tribal sculpture and he said yes, he did have tribal sculpture in mind and that the brush strokes followed the scarifications that are such a feature of certain tribal sculptures. Cubism is a much less analytical, geometrical thing than I think we, we used to think. We needed to boil it down in a way in order to understand the formal development, uh, but there's also something shadowy and, uh, and dark and haunting about cubism that is even more compelling. I think we can say that to the degree that Picasso was interested in, in various aspects of magic, that cubism itself should probably be understood um, partly in relation to that that theme in Picasso's work and in his life. Um, there's no question that the transformation of objects and of figures and of faces in Cubism uh, has a, an enchanted quality. And when we talk about breaking down and remaking the body or the face, uh, we talk about something that is almost a supernatural discipline. Uh, it is a display on the part of the artist of mastery over his subject, of complete control, of a godlike power. Cubism, a silly word invented by an antagonistic critic, was in fact a partnership with another progressive young painter, Georges Braque. For the next seven years, the two artists were inseparable, like two mountaineers roped together, Braque said. So we have to see Cubism as a combined operation. Paris, Picasso and Braque used to visit each other almost every evening, check out on what the other one had done. When they went away for the summer, they worked even more closely together. Here are two paintings done at Serret, French Catalonia, 1911, one by Braque and one by Picasso. Now they are extremely alike, but there are certain things which differentiate the two. In this painting by Braque, which is a still life, there were bullfights nearby over the frontier in Spain, and so we have references to bullfighting. We have the two banderillas. You see the spikes on it. We have Torero, reference to a bullfighting poster. We have a bottle and a glass, more than one glass. And the composition is fairly readable. Here, it's more legible. You, have, you know it's at Seret, the reference to the name C-E-R, that's Seret. Here is a table, bottle of rum, glass, and sheet music. And it's less exquisitely painted than the Braque. Braque was a marvelous painter and took hours, over, months over his paintings. Picasso does it in a much more summary, more direct, and more graphic way. And Although it's easier to see the similarities than the dissimilarities, the more you look, the more you can see that they are by two separate painters with separate vision. Fernand loved his blue period. She loved his rose period because she was its muse and model. But she didn't understand Cubism. You asked me to tell you about Picasso's final separation from Fernand. They were no longer at the Bateau Lavoir. They left the Bateau in 1909. They went to live in the Boulevard Clichy. It was there they met a couple, Marcusis and his woman Marcel Imbert. Marcel and Fernand became very close friends. 
Et puis... Picasso et Fernand were arguing more and more. Their relationship had grown stale. To rekindle Picasso's interest in her, Fernand spent a few days with an artist called Opie. She wanted to teach Picasso a lesson and hoped he would take her back. But Picasso took advantage of the situation and made off with Marcel Imbert, who called herself Eva. I'm curator of 19th century French painting at the Hermitage Museum, St. Petersburg, in Russia. Ten years ago, I was in this hall. Uh, it was the end of working day, uh, no public. It was uh, very dark. In the dark, I accidentally, I saw small inscription on this painting. It's only three letters, E, V, A. But this is very important um, letters because it means the name of Eva Gre, this Picasso Lava. Her real name was Marcel Humbert, but it was known as Eva, Eva Gre. Usually this painting was called Violin and Clarinet, but right now a scholars noted that it's a special kind of clarinet. It's tenor, Spanish kind of clarinet. E Picasso didn't miss opportunity to note his Spanish origin. After this, I understand much better this painting because I see that it's very important painting for Picasso. It's a secret message, maybe. It's like code, maybe puzzle for Picasso to represent this woman. Sometime in 1913, Picasso's beloved Eva fell ill. She told people she had TB as she didn't want them to know that she had cancer. Probably cancer of the breast to judge by this amazing image done in 1914 in which Picasso portrays her tenderly but also monstrously. Her beautiful pointed breasts nailed to her body by an alternate set of nipples. By 1915, Ava would be confined in a clinic. Picasso, who had had a psychic terror of illness in women ever since the death of his sister Conchita, screwed up his courage and went to visit her every single day. To help him through this nightmarish ordeal, he embarked on a very secret affair with a woman called Gabi de Pere. As Eva lay dying, Picasso fell more and more in love with Gabi. took her away to Saint-Tropez for a few days. He sent her love letters, illustrated with watercolors of the rooms where they'd stayed. He entwined his name with hers and told her he loved her in every possible color. This puzzling painting, painted in 1914 in Avignon, was found only after Picasso's death. He'd kept it hidden ever since he painted it and showed it to nobody. And one can see why. On the right, you see Eva. It's almost the only figurative representation of her. It's probably one of the first attempts on his part to leave Cubism and try out some kind of more representational style. And then, in December 1915, Ava died. Two months later, Picasso asked Gabi to marry him, but she turned him down. 
Picasso was more than ever tormented with grief and guilt, self-pity and despair. Remember, too, that this was one of the darkest periods of World War I. Most of Picasso's closest friends were away at the front, and he felt very, very alone. Shortly before Ava died, he had expressed his despair in a self-portrait in the form of what else but a harlequin. For many years, nobody even noticed that Picasso had left a profile of himself, a shadowy one, on the white rectangle that the Harlequin holds. Picasso portrays himself spotlit against the blackness of Ava's mortal illness and the blackness of war. Indeed, where are we? Golgotha? No man's land? Surely not Montparnasse.